Today is a topic that it's like for Katie and I, it was a dream. It is one of our dream topics because we were not able to find anybody all summer or all winter long to do anything on engines or how things work. Um, just and we happened to say to Miss Anna one day, hi, George. That's not what we said to Miss Anna. We didn't say hi, George. But we said to Miss Anna, do you have anything on engines? And she just wrote this whole long list of all the things she could do, which was so exciting. So we're going to turn it over to Miss Anna and we're going to save our materials to the end. But we have a big surprise when we're going to be building with these as well as after the session, I will be sending um, and Katie will be sending a news uh, a sort of an update with what Miss Anna did as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Miss Anna, and we're going to have a blast. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Like Molly said, it is so great to see you all here live um, to anyone who's watching the recording after the fact. Hello to everybody out there, too. Um, it is a beautiful day here in Michigan where I live. Um, and so I completely understand sometimes it's just one of those days where you got to go outside, get some sunshine, get some vitamin D. Um, but we are here today to talk about electric motors. We're going to talk about how electric motors work, how they were discovered, and how you can actually make an, um, a machine or something that uses an electric motor really, really easily at home, which is um, what we'll be using those backpack materials for a little bit later on in the program. So. We are here to talk about electric motors, but before we do that, um, I'm curious to everyone out there, if you could look around in maybe even just the room that you're sitting in right now, you don't need to go anywhere else, I bet that you can tell me an example of a machine that you have just sitting in the room with you. So take a look around, and when you find a machine, tell me in the chat what you have found. Because we're going to talk about what is a machine and some different types of machines before we get to electric motors, which can be a little bit more complicated. So if I look around my room, hmm, you know, maybe we need to think about the definition of a machine. Ooh, Wes and Faye said they have a Roomba, and that is a fantastic example of a machine. I'm pretty jealous that you have a Roomba because I have to vacuum my house myself, um, and I have a cat, so there's lots of cat hair all over the place. I wish I had one of those. That's a great example of a machine and a Roomba is actually a good example for us to talk about the definition of really what is a machine. A machine is just something that helps people accomplish a task. So a machine does work for people. Um, that work can be anything. It could be vacuuming your floors for you. That's a great example of a machine. It's something that makes our lives easier and makes doing work a little bit more simple. Ooh, Alec and Elise have a jukebox in the room you're sitting in? What? Wow. That's pretty cool. I've never seen a jukebox anywhere except for maybe like a restaurant or a bar or something like that. Um, ooh, Weston Bay said they have one cat and two dogs. And I think, you know, maybe by a funny definition of a machine, right? I might call my cat a purring machine sometimes. Um, but machines are generally things that people have built. And so we don't build cats and dogs. Um, people are not ex an example of a machine, not by the definition that we're talking about, right? Um, because humans are not man-made. We don't assemble people. Um, and so people, animals, not necessarily examples of machines. But if I look around my room right now, right, I have a remote. A remote is a machine, right? It uses um, some technology so I can either change my camera angle like this, or if you have a remote at home, yours probably doesn't control a camera. Um, it might control your TV channels or something like that. That's an example of a machine. Um, but we can think even more simply than some of these really modern types of machines. Of course, cars are machines, um, cranes or drills or power tools. Those are all machines. But before we had any of those, we had our first group of simple machines. And so we're going to talk about some simple machines. We'll talk about all the different types and how they relate to what we're talking about today. So let's see. All right. You might have to tell me in the chat, um, are you able to see my screen? Sometimes I'm not well versed in WebEx. So just quick question to all of you watching at home. Can you see my screen as our first image? Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. Look at me learning how to use WebEx here. So our first type of simple machine is an inclined plane. 
And we might know this more commonly as a ramp, right? Almost every public building has a ramp that leads up to it. We can even attach ramps or incline planes to things like moving trucks, and that helps us to do work more easily, right? So instead of having to pick up heavy objects or instead of having to lift wheelchairs or things like that and going up uh, a step or a stairs or up into a truck or a vehicle, right? We can actually push and redirect our force up the ramp. And so an inclined plane is one type of simple machine that we use to accomplish work more easily. Our next type of simple machine is a wedge. And a wedge and an inclined plane look very similar to each other, right? When we look at them in their most basic form, just in these drawings over here, an inclined plane and a wedge look almost like the same thing, but we use them for different tasks. So instead of using a wedge to get something from a lower to a higher elevation by pushing on it or rolling it, instead we use a wedge to separate objects. And so something like an ax is an example of a wedge. A wedge, right, we swing it with some force and the shape of the wedge, how it's pointed on one end where all of that force is directed, once it goes into your object, right, the force is then redirected to either side, which can help you to split something like a log. The next type of simple machine is a lever. And you'll see that this one consists of two pieces most times. So a lever has a flat surface and then what we call a fulcrum, which again looks a lot like a wedge or an inclined plane. You'll start to see that these all have a lot in common, right? But we use them for different purposes. Now, levers, again, help us to redirect a force. So the, an example that we might not think of as a lever, but is actually a really great example, is something like a hammer or the claw side of a hammer, right? So by pulling on the handle, we can redirect our weight or the force of our hand pushing on that on the handle of the hammer, and it will help to pull something out of the wood. Now, this version of the lever, the green one right here that has our flat surface and our fulcrum, which is the point that the weight gets balanced on, looks a lot like something I'm sure you've all seen before. What does this lever look like? Maybe you can tell me another example of a lever that this green object looks a lot like. What does it look like? Yeah, Wes and Faith think it looks like a teeter-totter, or you might call it a seesaw. I've heard it called both. I call it a teeter-totter as well. Um, but it's a playground toy, right? So simple machines can help us to accomplish tasks, even if that task is just having some fun, right? Um, but that is another great example of a lever, which is our third type of simple machine. The next simple machine that we're going to talk about is a wheel and axle. And that is a very important simple machine. Um, since we invented the wheel and axle, civilization here on Earth has come a long way. If we didn't have wheels and axles, we couldn't have cars, at least not in the version that we have right now. Maybe one day we'll have flying cars or hover cars or something like that. But we rely on wheels and axles in order to help us move heavy objects in something like a car, right? We wouldn't want to push a car um, across the ground, right? Because the force of friction would be too great. We wouldn't be able to overcome it. It's very, very heavy. And so the wheel and axle will help us to push that weight across a surface. But we can also find wheel and axles in things like doorknobs. Um, I'm sure that you can all think of other examples of wheels and axles. If you've ever seen a pinwheel before, um, that has an example of a wheel and axle. Um, so that one is a very, very important simple machine. All right, second to last one here. Another simple machine is something called a screw. And we might think of a screw as more of an object, right? Not necessarily a machine. Um, we normally use this word screw to describe this object, right? But what a screw is, is really just a wedge wrapped around an incline, or I'm sorry, an inclined plane wrapped around a wedge. So you can see that the inner part of this screw is very, very similar to a wedge. It's pointed on one end so that it can enter an object and then the inclined plane actually wraps around the outside 
in the form of these grooves. And that can help us um, to make things like fasteners. So screws can hold objects together, but we also use that same principle in order to seal things closed, um, things like jars or lids. Um, so we have all sorts of different types of screws as well. The last type of simple machine is a pulley. And again, this one helps us to redirect force. So by pulling down on the rope in a pulley, right, we can lift the bucket up. And in some cases, this can be much easier than having someone climb very, very high in the air and pull up on something heavy like a bucket, or I'm sure we've all seen a, a giant crane used for construction, maybe if you've ever driven through somewhere. Um, where there's a lot of construction going on or we're building new tall buildings. Um, we use cranes which rely on things like pulleys. We can use a downward force to lift something into the air. Now all of these are examples of what we call simple machines, just one type of machine and none of these rely on power, correct? So we can make something like a simple machine in the form of what we call an automata. Now, I did not construct an automata today, um, but I did send over an activity guide where you can actually make one of these different types of automata using some very simple materials like um, either cardboard or an, an empty box. We have some either toothpicks or um, bamboo skewers that you might use for barbecuing. And then some various craft materials like either craft foam or construction paper um, or more cardboard. Now automata are actually some of the first machines that humans ever invented. Um, and so we say that automatas um, rely on lots of inner moving parts. parts um, oh, I see something coming up in the chat uh, that humans are natural machines. And so, like I said, there are different definitions. In um, engineering, we generally refer to machines as something that is engineered or designed, something that was um, built by humans in order to help us accomplish a task. But since we invented that word, right, we can use that word for lots of um, more metaphorical things, right? There are all sorts of processes going on inside your body all the time. And I know Lee does a fantastic program about um, humans and human body processes, right? Humans really are complicated, right? There's all sorts of jobs and tasks going on inside our body. Our different organs do different tasks. Um, and so we could certainly refer to humans as um, natural machines. Um, but for the object of today's activities and today's lessons, we're really just talking from a mechanical sense. And so far, we've not necessarily figured out how to engineer or build a human from scratch. Um, but maybe one day, you never know, right? That's a little scary to think about, but could be very, very cool if we could build something like that. But automata are actually something that people invented in order to almost mimic life. Um, so we can use these combinations of different cams and levers and pulleys, all those different simple machines that we talked about in our previous slide we can combine these different types of simple machines into what we call a complex machine, something that relies on more than just one type of simple machine in combination. And humans actually built these hundreds of years ago um, in order to almost simulate life, um, not to necessarily convince people that something was alive, but they used it for things like toys. Um, so this is an example of a automata that's over a hundred years old. And you can see that inside the back of this toy, um, it relies on all these different moving parts, things like wheels and axles or levers or pulleys. And as you wind the toy up and it unwinds, all these different parts will begin to move, which causes our automata to kind of recreate the movement that we might see in a human being. So in the case of this very old automata, um, this one would start to act like it was writing on a piece of paper. So um, just like humans rely on machinery, so do these different toys. Um, here's an example of a cardboard automata, something, that, something like this is something you could make by following the activity guide that Molly and Katie are going to send out. Now I have a question for all of you at home. 
What kinds of simple machines do you see here? So take a look at our automata, watch as it moves, watch what's happening as the person turns the crank there. What kinds of simple machines do you see? Think back to our slide, think about the different types of machines. Do you see any of those different types of simple machines that we talked about? I think they're thinking. I think they're thinking. Think about it. There's one really, really, maybe not completely obvious. Let's go back to our slide here. So think about that, and then we'll go back to our automata. Um, so we have inclined planes, wedge, lever, wheel and axle, screw, and pulley. So let's take one more quick look at our cardboard automata. And I definitely see at least one example of a simple machine here. I see a wheel test, right? So although this might not be used for the same um, tasks that we use wheel and axles for cars, right? We said door handles also rely on wheels and axles, and so does this automata. The axle, right, would be this bamboo skewer that goes through the entire box. And then our wheel rotates as you turn the crank. But there's also what we see over here, there's a lever. So that almost looks like a teeter-totter or a seesaw outside, right? So as one side lifts, the other lowers. Um, and that is an example of an, um, a, a lever which has a fulcrum. And this would be the fulcrum, this other bamboo skewer right here in the center that our cardboard is almost moving across. All right, so that is a simple or a complex machine that because we combine two different types of simple machines here, right? But so far, people are doing all the work to power these machines, right? So far, we've had a wind up toy, right, which relies on a person using their own mechanical energy to wind the toy. And then as that energy is released, um, our automata would start to move, right? And in this one, this one doesn't even wind up. In this example, the human has to power the device and for the entire time that it is on. So these are machines, right? This might help to make our lives a little bit easier, but as civilization progressed, right? And cities got bigger and objects got heavier and we started constructing more and more complicated things, technology had to keep up with us. We didn't want to always be the one turning the crank or winding the toys. We wanted something else to provide that initial amount of work, right? And that is where electric motors come in. So we have a diagram here of a simple electric motor. Um, and a simple electric motor comprises of a few different parts, right? We need some sort of power source. In this case, we have a battery. Um, so in this case, we have a battery providing the power or the electricity to our electric motor, right? So that already eliminates the need for a person or a human to provide the energy going into what this motor can do. Um, so we have our energy source here. Of course, in any sort of circuit, anytime we're working with electricity, we need wires or some sort of medium for our electricity to travel through. So you need some sort of wires. Um, and then what we also need is some sort of brushes that are also going to carry the current to what we call the commutator. And the commutator is just a big fancy word for the part of a motor that moves. Now, the direction of the motion could be in any direction, right? It could be circular, it could be back and forth. I'm sure we can think of motors that do both, um, but the commutator is the part that moves. And so these brushes will actually rub up against the commutator as it spins. And then the most important thing is noted on the top. This is actually the principle that causes electric motors to work. There are a north and a south pole noted right here, but those are imaginary. Those aren't something that we provide to the circuit. That's actually something that is created by the electricity inside. We know that electricity and magnetism are heavily, heavily linked, right? Um, you might remember our Van de Graaff generator. We've talked about it a couple times, I think, here. Um, and I'm sure you've maybe seen them in a couple other sessions. 
Um, but this helps us to understand just how much electricity and magnetism are linked together, which is really the basis for electric motors. So when we take our Van de Graaff generator here, right, invented by a guy named Robert Van de Graaff, because scientists love to name stuff after themselves. Um, when we turn the crank, right, when we turn this right here, which is, again, a wheel and axle, right, which is a, a crank is an example of a wheel and axle. Um, it's going to spin our brush um, or our rubber band, and it's going to rub up against a set of brushes inside the dome. Um, so as we do that, we generate an electric charge. Now I can feel the electric charge just because I'm standing kind of close to the dome, right? So as we do this, we are actually moving electrons, just like what happens in an electric motor. Um, the battery would provide it for the electric motor, right? But actually just the physical motion of this rubber band rubbing up against the brushes is enough to generate or move electrons. Now, Van de Graaff generators are not motors um, because they're not used um, to create moving electricity. They create static electricity, which we've talked about before, right? This is electricity at rest. Um, once the electrons move, from the rubber band to the dome or from the dome back to the rubber band, right? They stay there. They don't have a medium to travel through. Um, that's why we call it static electricity. Static means stationary or not moving. Um, and so this creates static electricity. But um, the reason we talk about the Van de Graaff generator and magnetism, right, is just like magnets, electricity um, um, behaves in a certain way. So I have my tray of packing peanuts here, which I'm sure you've seen me use before. Um, for this demo, I'll need to pan upwards just a little bit. Um, I'm gonna take my packing peanuts there and set them right on top of the generator. Now, when we turn the brush, right, we're actually taking away the electrons from the dome. It leaves it completely positively charged, right? Um, so in electricity, just like in magnetism, we say that opposite charges attract and like charges will repel. Anything that touches the Van de Graaff generator also becomes positively charged. So maybe you've seen this demonstration before. If not, you can still take a guess. What's going to happen to my packing peanuts if I charge up the generator, if I turn the crank and take away all of the electrons? Remember that the dome is gonna lose its electrons, the silver part right here, the tray is going to lose its electrons. The packing peanuts are going to lose their electrons. All of it will become positively charged. Um, so tell me, what do you think is going to happen? Make a hypothesis if you'd like. Um, I'll give you maybe five, four, three, two, one. And let's turn the crank and find out. Ta-da! We had repulsion, right? Since the packing peanuts were charged the same as the dome, since they both had a positive charge, you can think of that like a magnet. You can think about if they both had north poles, right? They don't want to touch each other. They want to be far, far away. And so they push apart. And scientists actually discovered this many, many years ago. As long back as the early 1700s, um, scientists and inventors were studying the link between electricity and magnetism so that they could harness that capability for us to do work or to build something like an electric motor. Now, this, like we said, was a great idea, um, really, really cool device, but this is not a motor, right? Because it's not actually helping us to do any work. But if we go back to that diagram um, or that slide that has our simple electric motor on it, you can see that as our um, commutator, the moving piece, is sitting inside this electric field, it is rotating. That's because our battery is providing the charge to these brushes. And then it's constantly switching its charge back and forth. So it's in a constant state of either attracting or repelling from the magnetic field that is created. Now we said that electricity and magnetism are very linked in that they've, we've been studying this for a very long time. Um, and scientists, until we discovered this very important rule, had kind of a hard time. 
um, we were trying to figure out how we can turn this link between electricity and magnetism into a machine that could actually help us, um, that could actually help us to do work. Um, and so this is what we call Fleming's left hand rule. Now, if you are holding a device, you might not be able to try this one out with me, but if you're not, I want everyone to take their left hand and it does have to be your left hand. So um, if you're like me, I know that I write with my right hand. Um, if, so don't use that one if you're right handed, but if you're left handed, use that one. Hold that hand up and what we are going to imitate is Fleming's left hand rule. So in the diagram over here on the left side of my screen, I have another example of a simple electric motor or what we might call a homopolar motor. The battery is causing our electricity to move from the bottom or it's coming from the bottom of the battery up through the top and then it travels back downward. And so that gives us the direction of our current. Doesn't matter which direction you hold your hand in, but you are going to imitate the same left hand rule with your left hand. Your middle finger is the current, and then your pointer finger gives you the magnetic field. Um, and you can see that they are at right angles from each other. It may not look like it, but if you were to hold your finger and point your magnetic field forward from your body, and then stick your finger that hold, represents current straight on a 90 degree angle or perpendicular, your current should be pointing across your body. Um, so I can show you that up close. Let me stop my share here. So again, if you are, my little icon is so small. Let me see if I can highlight myself. Maybe not. Um, all right, so if you are pointing out from your body, right, that out from your body represents the magnetic field, your middle finger should be pointing across your body, and that is the direction of your current. Once you know these two variables, there's also one more invisible force that's being created, and that is actually the direction of thrust or motion, and that is your thumb which if you're holding your fingers like I am, where my pointer finger is going towards you or away from my body, my current, my middle finger is going across my body, which represents current, right? The flow of electricity, my thrust or the direction of the thrust or the motion of my circuit would go up. Now, of course we can change it, right? If you keep your fingers locked in this position, I can turn them and I can change the direction of my force just by manipulating the other two variables. Once scientists understood this left hand rule that the electricity magnet and electromagnetic field results in a motion, then we started to create electric motors. Now I have an example down here on my table of a simple homopolar motor, um, a very simple electric motor um, I sent the activity guide for this one out to Molly and Katie, and I know they'll share this with you all after the program. Um, but for this, you only need a couple materials. Um, the one thing that's a little difficult to come by are these magnets. Um, so I have these magnets, and you can see that they are really, really strong magnets. These are neodymium magnets. Um, you can normally get them at a hardware store. Um, if you don't live near a hardware store, um, you could probably get these online, but they are just really, really um, strong magnets. And I just stuck them to anything made of metal to hold them in place. Um, you could stick them to a metal table, um, or you don't really need the piece of metal. It really is just here to help um, keep my battery in place because then I'm going to take any battery. I have a D cell battery here, but you could use a double A, you could use a C battery, um, anything but maybe not a nine volt battery just because the shape is a little different. Um, you can use that and you're just going to stack it right on top. Now, we have our power source for our motor, right? Um, and we're actually just amplifying our magnetic field by using these neodymium magnets. And then all we need to add to this, right, is our commutator, the piece of our homopolar motor that is going to move as it interacts with the electromagnetic field around this battery. 
All right, now I tried to build one before the program and it was working really well, but it's usually once I go to use it on camera that it decides not to work. And you'll see that I might need to do some minor adjustments here, but I'm not providing any sort of force to this um, activity. I'm not trying to spin it on my own. I'm just trying to rely on the resulting force that comes from the electric magnet electromagnetic field that's created. Oh, it was working. Now, when you create these at home, you just need to take some sort of wire. It could be aluminum wire or copper wire works really, really well. Um, and you're just creating something that balances on top of your battery. So you can see that I created almost like an M or a heart shape because it is symmetrical. Um, and you can see that even though I pushed it backwards, you can see that the resulting force actually goes in that direction. Um, so only a couple simple materials, right? A battery, a couple magnets, and then some aluminum or copper wire. Um, of course, you'll need something to cut your wire with. So I have um, some wire cutters here, um, but you can create your own very simple homopolar motor at home. Um, so I sent the activity guide for this one, but I also wanted to share with you just an example um, of what a really well high functioning um, homopolar motor looks like. So if you tweak it just right, if you get it to balance on top of the battery just perfectly, um, and then it's only touching the magnet at a very, very thin point of connection, which I think is my problem on the bottom of mine right now, is that it's not quite touching the magnet at all time, um, but you need that, right, so that our current is actually moving through the circuit, um, but not so much that the friction would slow it down. And so even without plugging this into the wall, um, you can actually build your own very simple homopolar motor, which is an electric motor itself. Now, we talked about how these motors work, and I want to talk about, a, let's see, I've got a couple minutes left to talk about some more um, motor. Oh, there we go. So the first electric motor that was used inside a machine um, that was actually used to do work was invented in 1834 by Thomas Davenport, which is this very, very serious looking guy um, right here. Now, we said that as early as the 1700s, so for over 100 years, people understood the connection between um, electricity and magnetism and how they can manipulate that in order to do work inside a machine, but um, they just hadn't perfected it just yet. Thomas Davenport invented the first true electric, electric motorized machine, um, and this is just a very small version of a printing press. Um, and so the electric motor inside takes electricity, sends it into the circuit, which causes this gear to rotate, and then does some work or does makes it into a printing press. Now, when we're talking about motors, right, we said we have to have a commutator, something that moves, something that rotates. And so we actually say that we measure motor speed in something called RPM. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard of RPM before, um, because if you've ever been in a car or maybe you know someone who's a big fan of cars, um, we measure how fast or how hard the engine in your car is working by RPM. But all motors measure their speed in rotations per minute. Um, and so every time one of these pistons, and this is a piston, this is actually uh, a part from a car, every time one of those spins around or makes a complete rotation, that is one rotation. Um, and however many times it does that in one minute is the RPM. So I have a bit of a trivia question for you all. Um, you can use your background knowledge or you can take a guess. I am curious to know, based on what you know about any of these objects, which do you think has the highest RPM or which of these rotates the most times per minute? So the options that we have here are helicopter blades. And so we know that helicopter blades will spin around and around and around and around and they push so much air down towards the ground, right? They're actually able to overcome the force of gravity. Um, we have an electric toothbrush, which maybe you have one sitting right in front of you. Maybe you could try to count it uh, in the next minute, right? So those rotate around inside, causing the bristles to move, help us to brush our teeth really effectively. 
Um, or we have a wind turbine. And I know that Canada has lots and lots of wind turbines. It's actually, I know some people don't like them, some people do. I actually think they're very, very cool. And so I love when I take a trip down the 402 that you get to see all the giant wind turbines. Um, and one of my favorite things is when you drive past a truck that's carrying one of those big blades. When I was younger, I used to think those were pieces of a uh, spaceship, um, but they're not. They're just really, really big, even though they might not look like it from off in the distance. So tell me in the chat, which of these do you think has the highest RPM, the most rotations per minute in its motor? Is it the helicopter, the toothbrush, or the wind turbine? I'll give you 30 more seconds to think about it. If maybe if you're still counting the RPM from your toothbrush. You might need a couple more seconds, but don't be discouraged if you can't. They do rotate pretty fast. All right, so we have some, let's see, we have some guesses. So Weston Bay thinks the helicopter. Catherine thinks the helicopter. Yeah, all right. So we are pretty well decided that the helicopter, it must rotate a lot of times, right? If that helicopter is supposed to be able to push enough air down towards the earth, um, displace enough air, right? It must rotate pretty quickly. So let's take a look at the answer. Hmm. Is anyone surprised to find out that the answer is the electric toothbrush? Helicopters, since those blades are so large, they actually only need to rotate about four, um, 450 to 500 times every minute in order to displace enough air to lift the helicopter off the ground. So they're very, very large. They rotate at about four to 500 rotations every minute. So that's still very, very quick, right? Um, that's almost 10 every single second, which is faster than we can count, right? That's why we can't actually see these blades rotate. Um, so, but electric toothbrushes rotate at over 7,000 RPM, over 7,000 times. That motor goes around and around and around every single minute. Um, that's why they're great for brushing your teeth, right? Um, wind turbines don't rotate very quickly, right? That would actually be very, very dangerous. Those blades are longer than a semi truck. And so not necessarily good if those were to rotate very fast. Actually, when the winds are very high, I know we put the brakes on or we actually stop them from rotating because we really only want them to rotate a maximum number of 20 times per minute. And that's a lot, right? They're very, very big. So 20 times for these blades to go around in a circle every minute is still a lot. Um, but there's one last definition that I want to talk about before we get to our last activity where we're actually going to use our electric toothbrush to create our own fun little doodling machine. Now, wind turbines are not actually motors. We would not classify them as motors, even though they have a lot of the same properties, right? Um, they definitely have some electrical components, they definitely rotate, but let's think about the definition of our machines, right? Um, or think about what a motor normally does for us. Motors take energy, that could be energy from a combustion reaction, like the engine in a car, um, it could be the energy from a human spinning something, right? And they turn that into work. Um, so motors generally take electricity, to spin or to rotate and then turn that into work for people. But think about what wind turbines do. Do they take electricity and turn it into work? Or do they do the opposite? Do they take work and turn it into electricity? It's actually the opposite, right? So wind turbines, even though they have lots of the same types of components, they actually take that process and throw it in reverse for us, which is fantastic. That's why wind turbines are actually able to provide power to our homes and to our cities. So I have an example of something that works very, very similarly. Um, instead of calling a wind turbine an electric motor, we would actually classify a wind turbine as an electric generator, something that takes work or mechanical energy, right? from the wind causing those blades to spin, and it turns it into electrical energy, energy that we can use to power up our homes or to do different tasks. Boy, should, the last person to wear this hat must have had the world's largest head. Go ahead, I'm gonna tighten it down a little bit. I also have a very small head. 
So don't let anyone ever tell you that having a small head means you're not smart. So I think I'm pretty smart, even though my head is very, very small. Um, so I obviously can't fit a wind turbine here inside my distance learning studio, um, because if you've ever seen one, they are very, very large. Um, and so just don't have the space for it. But I have something that is another type of generator. This is a hand crank generator. And so when I turn the crank, I'm taking the mechanical energy from my own hands or my own arms, and I'm causing the device inside to rotate. As these gears inside rotate around, they actually create an electrical current, which I then send through this wire up to my helmet, and hopefully we'll get to see the results of this generator at work. So wind turbines are generators just like this hand crank. Um, so let's see, if I rotate it slowly, we don't see a lot, right? Um, because I need to accomplish a certain amount of voltage or power in order to see an effect. But let's see, I might need to, sorry, my little thumbnail is so small, so I just can't actually tell how well you can see everything today. Um, but if I spin really quickly, you should be able to see that my little light bulbs on my hat are lighting up, just like we would power up our homes in our cities. Ready? One more time. Ta-da! But you'll notice that as soon as I stop cranking, right, as soon as I stop spinning my hand crank generator, the lights go out. Um, that's because I lack a battery in this circuit, some way for me to store the energy that I've created. And so I don't necessarily have a battery, but this hand gen crank generator works just like a wind turbine, which is not necessarily a motor. All right, now we mentioned our electric toothbrushes. And so of course, this is the part of our session where if you have the backpack materials ready, if you have these things at home, or if they were shipped to you, or if you went out and collected them yourself, um, go ahead, get them out, get them ready so that we can use them together. Um, if you aren't, if you don't have them with you here now, of course, the recording is going to go up tomorrow. Molly and Katie have a, some instructions that they're going to send out to you. Oh, I need to take, don't worry, you don't need packing peanuts for these. They're just kind of loose and sitting here on my tray. Um, so the things that you'll need if you are doing this activity now or if you're watching because you want to try it later is you'll need a short length of a pool noodle. Um, about a third, or I would say like about a foot's length of pool noodle. Um, less is fine as well. You'll find out why. Um, you'll need one of these disposable electric toothbrushes. Um, so I actually got this at the dollar store. Um, so you can get them with the dollar store. They actually come with a battery. Um, so you can just get them for a couple dollars. Um, you'll need at least three markers, three or four markers or writing utensils of some kind. And that's what's going to help your robot um, to doodle for you some elastics. I've got a couple here. Um, you'll need at least two. Um, I've got a couple extra just in case we might need them. And then anything you'd like to use to decorate your scribble bot. Um, I have some pipe cleaners here. These are my favorite things to use um, for my scribble bots. Um, but you can add googly eyes, anything like that. Now, what we're going to be doing is constructing a machine that relies on the motor inside our electric toothbrush in order to move. So if you turn on your electric toothbrush and you have it in your hand, you can actually feel every single rotation from this motor. Um, if I place it on the table, you can see it kind of starts to wiggle back and forth, only very barely. Um, but what we're going to do is we're actually going to utilize that in order to cause our robot to be able to move around and draw all over a surface. Um, so what we'll wanna do first is you're going to take your two elastics and you're just going to wrap them around your pool noodle. Now, if your elastics are much bigger than the pool noodle, you might just need to wrap it around back and forth. Um, so it's just on there nice and tight. Um, so you'll need two of these. And you can always move them later. So it doesn't matter too much right now where you place them. You just wanna place both of your elastics on your pool noodle um, maybe closer to one end, your bottom side of your pool noodle than the top. So um, if you're doing that at home, I'll give you just a moment to try that out. You can always add more or less elastics later once we get to our next step. Um, wrap them around nice and tight um, because these are what are going to hold on your writing utensils. So I have um, three markers here. If you have four, um, you can use four utensils, you can use five utensils, you can use six utensils. Um, but two doesn't necessarily work. You have to have at least three um, so that they can actually stabilize your robot. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your three writing utensils 
and you're just going to push them underneath your rubber bands. You want to leave the drawing side of your utensil, the side that has the cap or the side that has the end of your pencil um, sticking out. So pointed down so that when you're done with your robot, it can actually stand on those utensils on the table. So I have one. I'm just going to add all of mine right next to each other and then we'll talk about how to balance it. So if you're doing this at home, um, you can try to balance them right as you go, or I think it's honestly easier sometimes just to put them all on and then you can actually rotate them around um, to get them to balance. Because right now, right, if I tried to pick up my doodle bot or my scribble bot, it's just going to fall over. But we're going to create almost like a tripod. Since I have three legs here, um, I'm going to just scoot them around push them underneath the rubber band, roll them a little bit, um, and try to get them to be spaced out pretty evenly. So you can see that I've formed a triangle here, and triangles, um, if you know anything about engineering, triangles are actually one of the most stable and strongest uh, shapes in all of geometry. And so three works great. If you have four, um, create some sort of square, and then just test that your robot will actually stand up on its own. And mine does, um, so there we go. You can go ahead and try the same thing, um, get all of your markers attached, and then we are just about done. Now, right now, your robot doesn't do a whole lot, right? Um, we don't have our robot doodling or drawing on anything. Um, that is where the electric toothbrush comes into play. And so what you're going to do is you're actually going to take the electric toothbrush and you're going to be sticking it inside the hole, inside the pool, um, pool noodle. Now, Mine has to go in in this direction because the switch to turn it on is on the very top. Um, but if yours isn't, you could put yours in upside down. You could put yours in differently than I'm putting mine. Um, again, this is an art project just as much as it is an engineering design challenge. And so you can make yours however you'd like. You can make it custom. If your switch is on the side, um, you can just place it in there for now as a placeholder. And you might just need to take it out, turn it on, and put it back in once you're ready to go. Now, of course, this is an art project, right? And so you want it to be nice and fun and cool looking. And so that is where your decorations come in hand. So you can take things like pipe cleaners and you can actually poke them right into the pool noodle, which is why these are my favorite things to attach is because um, they're super, super easy. You can make things like hair or an outfit make anything you want. I just like to make mine look all fun and crazy and just kind of poke them in wherever they fit. The one thing I couldn't find at my dollar store was um, stick on googly eyes. So if you got stick on googly eyes, I'm very jealous. Um, I think eyes make them look like a lot of fun, but um, I'll have to do without just for this time. That's okay. Try another dollar store later on. So you can see that I'm just poking in my decorations wherever I want them to be. Um, this is your project, so you can attach all sorts of different things. You could glue things or tape things to your doodle bot as well. Um, let's see, I might try to make some eyes or like glasses out of my black pipe cleaner here. And then with our last couple minutes, once I have my glasses made, we are going to try to get our robot to turn on. All right, so we've got some eyes. They kind of look like eyes or glasses. I am no artiste, but I try my best. All right, now that we've got our doodle bot fully assembled, it's time to turn it on, to give it a try. So all you need to do is, of course, you'll need to take the caps off your markers if you're using markers. Um, that way your writing utensils can actually go right down on your paper. Now. I, before this program, actually covered my entire table in um, a big sheet of butcher paper. But if you don't have that at home, please don't set your draw or your machine down on your own wooden table at home. You can put like a piece of paper on a paper plate or have it draw right on a paper plate um, or maybe take it outside where you're not as worried about what it might draw on. These are, of course, they're washable markers, but I don't want to be responsible for anyone who might be drawing on their table at home. Do not condone it. And then once you've got it all set up on your paper, you are just going to go ahead and turn it on. And you might need to, you'll find that if you want your robot to move, you might need to do some adjusting of your markers. And 
Sometimes it helps to put your doodle bot on a bit of an incline so you can try moving around your tray. But you can see that our markers, whoop, our doodle bot is moving. And I'll show you the art that it's creating in just a moment here. Um, before the program, of course, I made more than one because it's always fun to have some sort of doodle bot battle here on the paper. See who draws the best artwork. Oops. This one is loud. Different brand of toothbrush, I think. Oh, it's very loud. Maybe try this one instead. Um, but they are doodling on the table. This one's stuck off of my sheet. I might actually just put it down here on my butcher paper, let them go. Um, and you'll notice that even though we think of electric toothbrushes as rotating back and forth, right, in a uh, linear direction, in a straight line, as they kind of scrub our teeth, you'll notice that your doodle bot almost always draws in circles. They actually rotate around, and that is actually the rotational motion of the motor inside. That is those rotations per minute. And on my last one. Ooh. There we go, that one works really well. Um, and you can see that it starts to doodle all over your paper here. Creates some pretty cool spiralized art. Um, and like I said, if yours isn't moving, you can try adjusting the height or direction of your markers. I think this one is just, there we go. Now they're going. So now we're having a good type of doodle bot art challenge here. This one, I think the battery is bad. Let's try one more. Oh no, they're fighting. But hopefully yours at home are doing the same. Um, if you have any questions, I know we're just about out of time here. Um, you can let me know in the chat. This one is doing a great job. I'm gonna put it on the piece of paper so you can maybe see this a little better so I can show you the art. Um, I think the difference is I kind of angled the markers out to the side just a little bit. Um, and you'll notice that the position of your markers really affects how well your robot draws. Oh, yeah, there we go. Ta da! Twin doodle bots. Um, this one I made cute with a mustache, but his battery doesn't work. Um, but that is about all we have time for today. I know I'm just about out of time. Um, I'm not sure if this is our last session together for the summer. If so, I want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in for so many sessions with me, um, for talking to me all about science and the cool things that you've learned outside of our sessions together. I know that I've had just the best time. It's been so much fun. And I really, really hope that I'll get to see a lot of you again during the school year too. And Miss Anna, we just want to say thank you for being like the best Wednesday science teacher we've ever had. Uh, we can't wait to start booking you for Connected North. And I, what I've loved about this particular session is the students made connections to what we did with the Ontario Science Centre yesterday with the triangles, because they popped right in and said, yep, we learned about that yesterday. So thank you so much for all you've taught us about hissing Madagascar cockroaches and the sounds that the earth makes and the planets and um, Arctic cold adaptations, like everything. You've been just phenomenal. So thank you so much for everything. We'll see you in the fall. We'll see you all in the fall. Bye everybody. And thanks everyone. We'll see you this afternoon for planets. Bye guys. That was awesome. <laughs>